I mean, is it possible just to have her thing floating there? What thing? I believe so. This slide, yeah. without all the framing. Are you going to sit right there? That, that, that was what I was asking about. Mm -hmm.
African Institute. My name is Daniel Van Sant. I am our Director of Disability Policy. Uh, to describe myself, I am a white man in my early 30s. I'm wearing a dark blue suit with a blue and gray tie. I have a name tag on with my name and my position. I'm also proudly wearing a lapel pen of a Drake Bulldog because in addition to working here, I did graduate from Drake with my undergraduate degree. Um, we describe ourselves, of course, because the theme of tonight's event is giving people access to art. And not to say that I am art, but I certainly want to make sure that you have access to everything that we are saying. So in order to do some introductory remarks, for those of you who it's your first time here at the Arkin Institute or for joining us online, I want to talk a little bit about those accessibility features. So we do have audio description provided so that people who are not accessing this presentation visually still have that same information. We will still ask, though, that every speaker who comes to the microphone describe themselves like I did so that you can describe yourself how you prefer to be described and presented. We are also providing American Sign Language as well as CART transcription, both online and here in the room, for access to everybody. And for those of you in person here, we do have a wellness sensory room upstairs, so at any point you would like to use that space or whatever you need to use it for, Please find one of the Art Institute staff to help guide you up there or give you instructions. You are also able to access this presentation visually from the hallway through the glass, and you can see the captions and the sign language from there if anybody just needs a little bit of space or to access it that way. So we thank all of you for coming here and participating um, in this presentation. So it is my pleasure to introduce both of our speakers today. Um, who have done a great amount in terms of giving people with disabilities access to arts, history, culture. Uh, so first I will start with Jill Wells. Jill is an Iowa-based artist and fellow here at the Institute. She's actually our newest Arkin Fellow and the first time that we have had a fellow in the arts field. And so we are very proud to now branch into this area of accessibility, which I'll discuss a little bit later. Uh, but I always like to frame it with that. Uh, Jill is also a Drake graduate. She graduated in 2005 with a Bachelor of Fine Arts um, and has been able to work now at the intersection of art, universal design, um, and accessibility. Her work has focused on how do you make visual art accessible to people who do not access things visually which of course then hopefully makes it accessible to all other populations as well, as you will see in her research. And I keep trying not to steal her thunder, but it's hard because there's a lot of thunder of hers that we can <laughs> steal. Uh, so Jill, as I mentioned, joined us as our most recent fellow. We were very fortunate to get funding from Bravo Greater Boyne in order to sponsor her travel to Belfast, Northern Ireland, to present her field exhibit, or a piece of the field exhibit, at the more than 600 people from 30 different countries who attended our Harkin Summit in Belfast. And so we want to thank Bravo. I'm not sure if we have a representative from Bravo in the room or online. Yes, we do. Perfect. Thank you. I did see everyone who came in. So thank you for that support in helping get Jill's fellowship launched, literally and figuratively, as we launched her and her pieces over the ocean. Um, what I think is most striking about Jill's fellowship work and why we're so excited to have her join as a fellow is how her work intersects with disability employment in, I think, two really key ways that you'll see from her presentation. One, I think we often forget about the arts as a career field for people generally, but especially for people with disabilities. And a lot of Jill's work revolves around mentoring young artists with disabilities, artists of color, other young people who may not know that art is a career field for them. Um, so I think that's one. It's a very powerful representation of you can have a career in arts and culture, and you never want to lose sight of that. Two, I think in the disability field, we spend a lot of time, effort, and resources talking about how do we make healthcare accessible, education accessible, employment accessible, voting accessible. These are all 
very, very important things, right? These are all things that people need to be able to live. They're kind of the Maslow hierarchy items, right? You can't live if you don't have a job, access to education, healthcare, housing. But the things that we stay alive for are arts, culture, music, theater, sports, travel, all of these really beautiful cultural things, right? We all look forward to our days off of work where we can take our family to a concert, to a baseball game, to an art museum, and have access to culture as well. And so I think that's what really makes me emotional when I think about Jill's work is that people with disabilities also need access to art, culture, music, the beautiful things in life. Um, so, Without further ado, I will let you hear from the artist herself and welcome Jill up to the microphone. Accessible. 
So with that being said, I would like to introduce you to these cute, sweet, and the coolest people I think I've ever met, my brother and my sister. We've all grown up since this picture was taken, but most of the humor, the sassiness, and of course, the personality in the photo remains. In this picture, I'm actually seated first on my Uncle Todd's military duffel bag, and my brother and sister are seated behind me. My sister's name is Vanessa, and my brother's name is Lee Cole. We call him Lee. My sister is the eldest, and my brother is the middle child, and then that leaves me. So if anyone here tonight is the youngest in the family, maybe we have a shared experience. <laughs> No solo photos anywhere in the picture album ever. <laughs> um, but I do say this all in good fun because I truly was privileged. Being the youngest of three, I had multiple mentors and my siblings growing up. They were living lessons, coaches, motivational speakers, trendsetters, rule breakers, and risk takers. They always had my back. We were raised in Indianola, Iowa by our widowed mother, who after doing the Heimlich Maneuver on a fellow high school student while working in the Simpson College lunchroom around her calling as a nurse. One of my favorite things to do growing up was spending countless hours going through my mom's medical books, looking at all the pictures and reading the descriptions. When my mom was at school or work, Vanessa and Lee and I would be across town at my grandparents' house. My grandfather ran his own insurance agency after his military service, and my grandmother was an artist, homemaker, and a partner in an insurance agency. I didn't know it then, but my entire family dynamic was shaping how I now work, why I do this work, and the very work I create. In 1998, our family dynamic changed instantly and dramatically when an intravenous malformation or an AVM ruptured in my brother's brain during his sleep. An AVM is an abnormal tangle of blood vessels connecting arteries and veins which disrupts the normal blood flow. For my brother, this rupture caused massive bleeding in his brain, a heart attack, and permanent brain damage. And it also was the cause of the loss of his eyesight. He had just gone to prom, was about to graduate from high school and was working on restoring his 1979 Chevy Silverado. Growing up, my brother was that kid who would intentionally place multiple garbage cans in his way as he dribbled towards the basketball hoop connected to the garage. This taught me an extremely valuable lesson. If you ever meet a person who intentionally places obstacles in their way over and over again in life in order to better themselves, you better watch out for that person when life itself places obstacles in their way. Many years into his recovery, we sat down around Christmas time to paint. We both found ourselves lost. On the other side, a host of big emotions from this life event it was a life-changing lesson the power of touch. The sense of touch is one of our central forms of perceptual experience, and it occurs across the entire body using a um, set of receptors in our skin. Touch, for my brother, is such an important thing. So asking my brother to use a paintbrush interrupted his perception. My mindset had been all wrong. He needed to use his fingers alone to perceive when the paint was connecting with the surface. So while this is not the case for all individuals living with different levels of sight impairment, this is the case for my brother. So after 20 years of being strictly a visual artist, I knew I had to change. I faced myself with one question. Are you okay with looking back on your life knowing that you could have done something about something that troubled you deeply and most and saying that you did nothing about it. The answer was the kind of no that makes you want to cry without sound or tears. And that, my friends, to me, is what regret feels like. This meant I needed to explore a vast landscape of diverse human experiences and community engagement beyond anything I had ever done before. I needed to explore a landscape of textures 
that are physical, emotional, and psychological. The materials, design, and sound to continue to move with and then beyond sight to engage with all of the human senses. So in 2020, not only did I step away from an eight-year career as a certified alcohol and substance use counselor for the state of Iowa to make art my full-time career, I also leapt into the discipline of multimedia arts. Establishing a partnership with the Iowa Department for the Blind during this initial week provided me with experts in the field to support and educate me and a community who could help me adapt. So I'd like to say thank you to Karen Cunningham, Denise Bean, and the Makerspace Creatives from Iowa Department for the Blind. I believe in individual and civic responsibility, and as a creative, I feel a great responsibility to use my art to provide a thoughtful critique of the different systems that work in our society to make this world a more accessible, universal, inclusive, empathetic, and delightful place. Because when you experience another person's awe and wonder over being able to touch your artwork, which historically has been inaccessible, it is not only extremely exciting and fun and playful, it is powerful. The visual changes. A full color photograph shows two seated people facing each other. A man on the left wearing a gray sweater and a blue disposable mask over his mouth is seated in a wheelchair. A woman on the right with short dark hair wears a gray hoodie and a black cloth mask. Both of them have placed their hands on a piece of art on the table between them. The piece is a dark blue flat surface with a blue three-dimensional three-inch butterfly rising from the surface. White text reads the story. This is the image of the first time my brother and I sat down to actually engage with sound touch activated art. Uh, we're in the library um, in Sioux City and it was an absolutely beautiful, um, very emotional experience. The visual changes to a full color photograph of a wall of multicolored butterflies mounted to the wall, all flying in the same direction. A man with short dark hair and sunglasses is on the left, both hands reaching slightly above his head, touching a small wooden frame also mounted to the wall of his butterflies. A tan box with black text fills the lower part of the graphic. The text reads, feel, please do touch the artwork. So in this slide, this individual interacting with this work is the first series of work I created on and from the Braille pages of the ADA of 1990. As the Mandela Washington Fellowship Coach this year, I was able to work with a group of 25 fellows from all over Africa. This individual was one of those fellows. When interacting with this artwork, one individual was able to translate to a group of over 30 people through his access to touch the artwork and knowledge of Braille, what the Braille text said. So let me ask you to think about what is happening in this moment. Daniel Van Sant and I have had many conversations about these types of moments. And I believe one of our favorite comes from a time in history when the communication was cut off during the 504 sit-in. During the third day of the sit-in and protest of the Carter administration's continued refusal to sign the enabling regulation of Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973, outgoing phone calls were blocked in the San Francisco Federal Building in an attempt to cut off the protesters' ability to communicate with the press and their allies outside. The government did not count on the creativity of the protesters as they use sign language to communicate with the other protesters holding the vigil outside in the plaza in front of the federal building. These protesters on the outside were then able to take their messages to the press and other intended targets. This allowed the protesters to continue to organize and keep their momentum going. What happens when we cut off communication? What happens when we turn on communication and diverse forms of communication. What happens when creativity is the vehicle? 
for moving communication. These were some of the exact questions I took to the heart and summit in Belfast this year. So over the next three slides, I'll be sharing some of these summit experiences with you in order to answer these questions. A full color photograph fills the screen. On an easel, there is a display showing a small wooden frame. Jill Wells stands and smiles on the left side of the photo. On the right, Senator Harkin is seated. His right hand is touching a small frame on the display. His left hand holds a device to his ear. The device is attached to the small frame with wires. White text across the bottom reads, Harkin Summit, Summit 2022. In this slide, I'm in Belfast, Ireland, interacting with one of my sound-activated braille works of art with Senator Harkin. So let me back up. This was my first time out of the country. I had been creating in the unfamiliar realms of sound, engineering, and electronic arts integration for just that shy 12 months. Just after I met Senator Tom Harkin and Ruth Harkin and was preparing to demonstrate my interactive work, the wireless battery powering the project decided to take a lunch break. <laughs> so no pressure. But in that moment, I was very afraid to fail. Now let me back up again. And I met Daniel Van Saint in 2020. And over the years, we've kept in touch via text and social media. So when he messaged me in January of 2022 for a Zoom call, I was excited to catch up, but I was also very curious. Zoom call? This was a little different. Daniel has always been a supporter of my work. And in this call, he came with the same support, but then he came with what would happen if you exhibited your interactive work in Belfast at the 2022 summit. The interactive works Daniel was talking about are part of the Blackboard Sensory Art Project, a project I established in 2020 to develop sensory inclusive accessible works of art and art experiences based on four primary questions. What is art to you? What is accessibility to you? What makes art inaccessible for you? And what role does art play in your life? With the focus of the summit being data that drives change and the mission of the overall Harkin Summit to bring together key champions and implementers from around the world to increase the employment of people with disabilities, my answer to his what if question was yes. And then we proceeded down the rural dreamers path, which for us usually takes a minimum of about two hours. <laughs> One could also call this strategic planning. Um, one could call this thinking out loud, brainstorming, but the truth is we were creating the first Harkin Institute Artist Fellowship. We were talking about how arts and culture impact policy, how social innovators and artists are transforming society, redefining narratives, changing stereotypes, and amplifying voices, and how art and politics influence and shape each other. We decided to build the plane while flying all the way to Belfast and back. And with additional support from Bravo, we made it there. And now, here I was, reminding myself to breathe, as Senator Harkin and hundreds of individuals from all over the world reached out over two days' time to communicate with artwork designed to communicate The visual shows three vertical slices of full color photographs. In the left slice, Jill watches as a man in a black leather jacket sits in a purple chair next to the display on the easel. The center photo shows a young boy in a blue t-shirt watching as a seated man in a leather jacket is now wearing headphones and listening. The right photo shows the young boy smiling at a man in a gray shirt listening through headphones. The exchange of information was astonishing. In our current climate, where our society is now relying on access to information as a form of knowledge and power, this information has the potential to make positive change. When we put to work, how could the vulnerable shared information of one summit individual say, oh, throughout my life, 
people have been afraid to touch me because they thought my disability was contagious. So being able to touch your work and witness others touch a tool connected to disability accessibility gives me hope. Or how could the shared information of, quote, subtitles are no longer just for individuals living with hearing impairments. Or, quote, I've never experienced art like this. Thank you for thinking of me. Or, quote, when I was younger in school, my teacher used to put the word with the picture. I believe that would help. How could all of this information be the data that drives change? At the root of so many of these shared experiences and information was a deep desire to normalize something that should have never been abnormalized to begin with. It is not abnormal to live with a disability or multiple disabilities. It is not abnormal to touch another human being or to touch art or to touch braille, to use closed captioning, to continue to use elementary educational tools as we age. It is not abnormal to be equal. And yet, we too often continue to coexist in this way. Some of this is the nature of being human and imperfect, and yet I believe a good deal of this is within our control to change. Much of my work is about access while at the same time being inaccessible and about inaccessibility for this exact reason, because we have much work left to do. 85% of the individuals I surveyed at the summit had never engaged with Braille art, and over 50% of them said they hadn't actually ever thought about art being the catalyst for policy change. Mm -hmm. According to the latest Throsby report making art work, artists living with disabilities are underrepresented, earn less than their counterparts without disabilities, experience unemployment at higher rates, and are more likely to identify a lack of access to funding as a barrier to the professional development. And although 49% of people with disability are in the lowest two quintiles as a cohort, they are almost three times more likely to give money to the arts. Mm. On the last day of the summit, the visual shows three vertical slices of full color photographs. The left photo is an aerial view of paint cans, brushes, and trays of brightly colored paint on a drop cloth. The center photo shows a group of adults and children working on an outdoor mural. The slice on the right is a close-up of a young man in a green shirt painting a part of the mural. A challenge was called out from the closing keynote speaker, Judy Human, to within 24 hours of the summit closing, set a goal connected to the summit's mission and get to work on making it happen. I smile thinking about how months ahead my dear friend and Dublin Street artist Chelsea Jacobs and I started to plan the logistics for this very action. Visual is a full screen photograph in color of the finished mural. On the left side of the mural is a profile of a black person with short hair looking to the left. She is painted in blacks and purples on a red background, and her profile is about seven feet tall. Large leaves in blues and greens rise from the base of the mural. The word love is written across the foliage in black block letters. The word love in large braille letters sits above the text. Jill, Jill and Chelsea stand to, to the left of the mural. As they, they smile at the camera, their, their fingers touch to form the shape, the shape of a heart. We had no idea this call was coming. We were just two creatives who cared deeply about equality, civil rights, and representation, and wanted to create a work of art about this very thing together. So after the summit, I took the train from Belfast to Dublin, and within six hours, we completed a community engagement mural entitled The Dublin Love Project. I share this because through creating one of the most accessible forms of art, which is public art, a group of individuals from two continents who had never met before, other than Chelsea and I, came together to start conversations about disability, LGBTQ plus awareness, and diverse social problems in an inclusive way. 
So as I close out, I would like to leave you with a call of action of my own, entitled, The Future is Accessible. A full-color photograph shows two women touching an installation of butterfly wall art. The lower one-third of the screen is a tan box with black text. The text reads, the future is accessible. This is a call for visibility and intersectionality. It is a call to prioritize equality and accessibility. So some brief examples of what this could look like, if you're curious, would be using alt text or using or creating digital web accessibility tools, creating more inclusive workspaces, art spaces, educational spaces, and play and entertainment spaces. Working on person-first language, sharing about disability awareness on your social media platforms, providing ASL training in workspaces, and last, making time and space for the difficult conversations and questions surrounding equality and inclusion. And when those come up, actively listen. Because none of what I shared today would have come to pass without other people. Nothing I do is on my own or by myself. In my fellowship work here at the Harkin Institute over the next year, I will be conducting rigorous, socially engaged research and play to create and develop progressive, inclusive, accessible new works focused on problem solving and place making. There were many things I was unable to share in this 20 minute presentation, so please reach out to me or let me know how I can reach out to you to keep these conversations going. A picture shows five little <coughs> slice boxes, and they fill the top of the screen in this photo, each a different color blue, orange, green, red, and black. Each is reflected in the shiny surface on which they sit. In the lower half of the screen, there is white text. Former President Franklin D. Roosevelt once said, the test of our progress is not whether we add more to the abundance of those who have much, it is whether we provide enough for those who have too little. Thank you.
Um, I also wanted to plug for Jill to any of her pieces that you see in the Institute are for sale, including Black Butterflies. So if anyone is really moved by the piano, um, you could move it to your own location by purchasing it from City Sounds. So be sure to talk to City Sounds. I believe we have Monica here from City Sounds. Um, she will be stationed close to the piano if anyone is um, inspired to do that. And then you can also talk to Jill about purchasing her other pieces. So my call to action is kind of a question for everybody to think about, um, and then an actual call to action here. But whether you have experienced Jill's works now through the YouTube live stream, or through watching the presentation here in person, or when you go to experience them in the reception, if this is the first time that you've ever been to an art event like this that has audio description, that has sign language and art, where you can grab the pieces and take them off the wall and interact with them and speak with the artist. If that's the first time you've ever experienced anything like that, I want you to think about why that is. And then what does that tell us about our society and how we view access and art and culture? Um, and if anyone has answers, I will be around the reception. And as Jill mentioned, you can talk about this for hours. My other call to action is a little bit self-serving, but it's to serve Jill. Her fellowship is not possible without donations and support. And so if anybody is moved by her pieces and her presentation tonight, and you want to support that, please know that you can. We've made it very easy for you to support the Jill's fellowship. Um, so we have a link online for those of you watching virtually where you're able to make a donation to support her work, to expand her mentoring, her production of art, and make it more accessible. For all of you in person, you can find any of us that work at the Art Institute. We have pledge cards out of the reception and also have the website for you as well. Uh, we want to see Jill's work continue, and it needs that continued sponsorship like what we received from Bravo uh, to make that possible. So please reach out if you think that you could be the next sponsor of her work in any amount or um, level. I now get to introduce our next speaker, who is Mary Dolan. Mary Dolan is the Executive Director of the FDR Memorial Legacy Committee, which serves to preserve the memory of Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt's accomplishments, especially for people with disabilities. Mary has been involved in disability rights for over 20 years. She was a member of the senior leadership team at the National Organization on Disability from 1995 to 2011. She served as the director of the World Committee on Disability with the responsibility for executing all aspects of the FDR International Disability Award. In 2012, she founded Inclusion Zone, which is an organization that educates and informs about the impacts various issues um, have on children with disabilities. And she has hosted hundreds of podcasts on these issues as well. She has worked as an educator for students with disabilities from 2012 to 2019, and she is an educational advocate for her own son and has often talked about her own disability experience. Welcome, Mary Dolan, to our podium. Memorial Legacy Committee. Okay, the background of all slides from this point over, 
forward will follow this scheme. There is white text that reads, FDR Memorial Legacy Committee, the citizen-led group supporting the Franklin Delano Roosevelt Memorial, Washington, D.C. Education, inclusion, preservation. So the mission of our organization is really those three words that I just mentioned. Um, and actually, I should pause for the description. The graphic features the photograph of the FDR wheelchair statue at the FDR Memorial. The bronze statue shows FDR seated in a wheelchair wearing a hat and looking boldly ahead. The white text title reads, The Mission of the FDR Memorial Legacy Committee. So we have three things we focus on. Education about the FDR Memorial, but particularly the dis starting with the disability history and then moving on to other underrepresented narratives of the FDR Memorial and FDR and Eleanor's legacy. Inclusion and accessibility at the memorial and making, trying to make the memorial the uh, best practice for access, um, and not just physical access, but art access. And then preserving the memorial for future generations and preservation, I think we all used to think about uh, bricks and mortar. Preservation also means preserving the stories. So that's another element to it. So, um, and importantly, we're committed to sharing the diverse perspectives of the Roosevelt era and that era's legacy today. On the left of this screen is a black and white photograph of a man in a wheelchair. He raises his right hand in a gesture as he speaks into the bank of microphones. A man standing behind him holds a sign that reads, Don't Hide FDR's Source of Strength. The photo caption reads, Mike Dellen, NOD Chair, speaks at DC protest. White text reads, Our Legacy, Born Out of the Disability Community. Thank you. And part of me, despite bringing a note to myself, um, I forgot to describe myself. So <laughs> allow me to do that now. Um, I have a uh, grayish, blondish, blondish, grayish, depending on um, <laughs> the lighting, uh, shoulder length hair. I'm uh, wearing a black shirt and a white and black <clears throat> jacket and pearls from my parents. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> Um, so our organization is born out of the disability community. While we are an organization that cares about the entire memorial, what's really important to understand is that we are of and from and about the disability community. We're going to do other things in addition to the disability story of the memorial, but that's our heart. That's where we're at. So <clears throat> what this... Um, slide is about is showing you a glimpse of a protest that was held in order to fight for the wheelchair statue that got added to the memorial. Because when the memorial was opened in 1997, there was no depiction of President Roosevelt as a disabled person. There are two colored photos on the right side of the screen, one above the other. The top photo shows a man with a gray beard smiling into the caption. Smiling into the camera, excuse me. The caption reads, Boris Halperin. The bottom photo shows an aerial view of the FDR memorial and the caption is such. White text at the top of the screen reads, the FDR memorial background. So just, just going in, um, background for a moment. The FDR Memorial was designed, designed in 1970, in the 1970s by Lawrence Halperin, uh, a highly, highly acclaimed um, landscape architect. If you Google his name, you will have a ton to read and it will be an absolute delight to learn about his contributions to landscape design in the United States. Um, also of great interest would be if you um, are fall, have, can't fall asleep one night, at Google uh, the, the attempts to build the FDR Memorial in the 50s and the 60s. 
so because there, there were designs and then they were accepted and then rejected and uh, and that happened a couple of times and then finally Lawrence Talbert came on the scene and he had it all together and he got five um, four or five uh, artists to work together and they, they came up with a plan that was just absolutely groundbreaking and rather than the one and done, that's my word, the one and done kind of memorial. So you all know the image of Lincoln, right? The Lincoln Memorial, you kind of go there, you, you, you see it at the, see them up at the top and you go, okay. And that's pretty much, you know, and then you go back downstairs and then you go on to other things. So Halbert's concept was literally a walk in the park, but not just a walk in the park, but a transformative walk in the park. So it's a series of four rooms um, that take you through the four uh, terms of FDR's administration. Uh, it's the first presidential memorial to be designed wheelchair accessible. And that's a big thing to say, recognizing that Larry Halbert was doing that in the 70s and that this was being built just a few years after the ADA was, was um, signed. And um, for a fun fact, it's the first presidential memorial to include a statue of a first lady and the first dog. So if you're small, it is, it is in the memorial. I think it gets more attention than just about anything else. Two photographs side by side fill this graph. On the left side is a full color graphic of a group of smiling people standing behind a bank of microphones. A man with a broad smile holds a large sign that reads, Don't hide FDR's source of strength. But the photo caption reads, Middle, Dr. I. King Jordan. The black and white photo on the right shows a group of people in wheelchairs and a man standing using a crutch. The man with the crutch holds a large black and white photo of FDR and a little girl. The photo caption reads, left, Justin Dart, right, Jim Dixon. White text at the top of the screen reads, where's the wheelchair protests? So as I mentioned, when uh, my bosses at the National Organization on Disability or when the disability community overall learned that when that the plans for the FDR Memorial, which was under construction in the early 90s, that it was not going to include a depiction of FDR as a disabled person. The disability community did what the disability community does, which is organize, get together, uh, and have a campaign. Um, and we did, uh, you know that thing called letter writing back in the day? So we did that letter writing thing back in the day. We did the phone call thing back in the day. A lot of meetings, a lot of no's, and, and then we started doing protests. Um, what I'd like to identify a few uh, luminaries in the disability community who were part of our protests, um, and which were identified just a moment ago, but in the middle of the photo on the left is Dr. I. King Jordan, who is, was the first deaf president at Value Debt University. Um, on the right, holding the sign, don't hide FDR's source of strength. It's Charlie Hodges, who was very active with the American Council of the Blind. The photo, the black and white photo on the right has Jim Dixon with his guide dog, Buckley. And a, way, a little few people down from him is the one and only godfather of the Americans with Disabilities Act, Justin Dart. So, it's really a big deal that these folks came out for this fight. This shows you how uh, critical the leadership of the disability community found this fight, this fight to be. That this presidential memorial was going to go in and, and it had to acknowledge disability. Think about also the timing. ADA, 1990, these protests are 1996. The, the community was organized and still fired up from the victory of the ADA, we were not going to go backwards. This slide features a color photograph. Bill and Hillary Clinton, Alan Tipper and others applaud as they stand in front of the FDR memorial. White text at the top of the screen reads, victory. So we had a victory. Um, with 
threats for more protests, um, and you know, get me on a side note at one point. Uh, but there were some some real um, challenging protests for the Park Service in having to deal with the the upset disability community. Um, I don't know if anybody's ever seen photos or been to a disability rights protest, but you know, they get real. Um, and so a few days before, it was very smart, a few days before, finally, uh, the Senate, the U.S. Senate passes a bill calling for the disability depiction to be added, uh, passes in the House, signed by uh, President Clinton, and so, yay, we get to say hey, the, there's going to be a some sort of depiction of FDR as a disabled person in the memorial. So let's let the dedication happen. And so they all had a great day. So did we, because we knew we had won that stage of the fight. And oh. white text at the top of the screen reads the FDR Memorial 1997. The screen shows two side-by-side -side color photos of the waterfall at the memorial. So I'm just showing you these pictures because one, they're spectacular. Uh, they're, they are the hallmark of Larry Halperin's work, um, fountains, water elements. Um, but the, the memorial in 1997, of course, was absolutely glorious. I'm going to do a callback to this picture in a little bit. So just want to keep this in mind. A visual changes, white title text reads, disability depiction. Okay, so like I said, a bill passes, gets signed, says, yeah, okay, fine, you really you upset disabled community, you can you can get a depiction. See ya. So we had to figure out what's it gonna look like. Where is it gonna go? And Who's going to pay for it? So um, I'm going to take the last one first. Uh, who do you think had to pay for it? <laughs> the disability community had to raise all the money for the statue, the $1.65 million. So uh, I mean, we were happy that we got what we asked for, but we uh, raised money. And those of you out there who know anything about any nonprofit, you know, Diverting to go and do a whole new fundraiser at that amount of money, um, it's, it's usually not in the strategic plan. Uh, so so um, luckily we did it. Um, for the next two questions, there are two side-by-side -side colored photographs on, on the left, left, a group of people, people sitting in wheelchairs, chairs, gathers around, around the bronze FDR wheelchair, wheelchair statue. The photo on the right is of the statue alone. alone. White text at the top reads, the result, the prologue room with the FDR wheelchair statue out of January 2021. Out of January 2001. Um, so six years, no, four years after the memorial was dedicated, the first time in May in 1997, four years later, this statue and prologue room is added at the beginning of the memorial. So six years of the disability community fighting, four years after the dedication. So there was a, a, a delta of four years when people went through the memorial and did not see that. So um, what was it going to look like and where would they put it? So like I said, they put it in the beginning. And what was it going to look like? This is a life-size statue. It is one that is away from the wall, and it is not on a pedestal. Why? Because it makes it more accessible. Uh, the disability community, in conversation with the artists, and this was done by Robert Graham, um, another very uh, renowned uh, sculptor, um, the disability community spoke out and said, make this something we can get it all the way around, whether it's in a wheelchair or with a guide dog or with a, a cane or whatever. Make it something we could have a physical experience with that we can touch. So this is an absolute um, treat to see people at the memorial interacting with this statue. Um, kids sit on his lap, they take selfies, they drape themselves all over him. It's, it's, 
really fun. So uh, that is the FDR wheelchair statue that um, really is the genesis for why I'm here today. White text at the top of the screen reads, to fast forward to 2019. Two color photos of the memorial are featured. The caption reads, a visit to the FDR memorial in 2019. So remember I said, uh, remember those photos of the water fountains? Okay, so um, 2001 happens, and yay, you know, we got the statue done, we raised the money, we put it in, um, and we all went on with other things, you know, here. Uh, you know, I, I had, we all had new, new jobs, or stayed with the same job, you know, had very full lives. And then we started saying, well, it's about time we write down this story, this history, to an epic campaign. It's part of the disability industry. It's part of the history of the memorial. Uh, you know, we deserve to, we, we need to write this down so that people will know that this, that the disability community needs a tremendous contribution. So I went down to the FDR memorial to just, you know, check it out again. And this is what I saw in 2019. I saw, I don't know, pond scum, <laughs> uh, shrubbery everywhere, overgrowth, non-functioning fountains, uh, lights weren't working, it was a mess. So I went back to my uh, advisory group and said, I think we need to do more than just worry about the story of the wheelchair statue. Um, this memorial needs a friends group. Um, so in order to protect our story and, uh, and our, our memorial, our statue, we need to take on the entire memorial. And then furthermore, I realized, for anyone to go through the memorial and really understand it, you should understand the disability experience of Roosevelt because that will further inform everything else that you see. So, so that's when we became the Memorial's Friends, Friends Group. White text at the top of this screen reads, Expanded Mission. So uh, those are the same, um, frankly, actually the same mission statements as before. So. Okay, so. This text reads, focus on access and inclusion. Thank you. This graphic shows two newspaper clippings. The first is titled, FDR Memorial's Braille Lettering is Too Large to Be Legible, Blind Visitors Say. The second is titled, FDR Memorial's Braille Letters Pose Sizable Problem for the Blind. So I just, I just want to point this out to you that the memorial was dedicated for the first time in May of 1997. This article was written in 1997. So um, let's talk about what that, uh, what that reporter was talking about. This is a law relief by Robert Graham. Would you like to describe it? Okay. This is a bar relief by Robert Graham. On the left hand side is what has been what are positive images. Okay. They are uh, something that you can touch. Um, <coughs> they're from photos. The columns in the back are negative images. They're the opposites of what's on the bar reliefs. What you see are hands, faces, people working. They are all images from the work, pro work programs and administration. You also see some dots. It looks like Braille. It is Braille. Um, but the Braille that you see on the bar relief on the left would then on the right be inverted and then thus not Braille. What that article said was that the Braille is too big and that there is Braille that is placed too high. And why? The artist responded, Robert Graham, saying, it's an invitation to touch. 
Um, I learned later on that Robert Grant's work is, was always about touch. Um, we're going to talk a little bit more about, about his work, but this occurred in 1997. That article went, went out um, into the news, and we were all kind of scratching our heads and didn't really understand the art, because I'm thinking, Jill, also of the art is something you just look at, right? as a passive person, and this was an art piece of engagement, and then there's also interpretation of art. So, we're going to get to that. Okay, so um, here we have a part of the bas relief that was put behind the FDR wheelchair statue. And on that bar relief is a quote by Eleanor Roosevelt, and this reads, Franklin's illness gave him strength and courage he had not had before. What you see under each letter is braille, but it is blown up, oversized braille. Um, so if you are a braille reader, you can take your time to slowly understand, oh, that's a D, but it'll take you a while. I don't read Braille, but this is how it's been explained to me. Oh, that's an A, okay, I get it. It's not the regular size that a person who uses Braille would normally go through. You have to read it, they have to figure it out, and then put the letters together in their head and go, oh, that is fundamental. Okay. Um, Again, Robert Graham, who did this, said he did it as an invitation to touch, as a representation of communication. Okay. Well, it got put in, and nobody knew what it was, other than we had, then Braille people said, I can't read it, and then the sighted people would go see it and say, isn't that lovely that they put in Braille for people? <laughs> so, that's 2001. Alright, so, so I told you we came on the scene in 2019, end of 2019, 2020, and I said, okay, we got to do something about it. Uh, so we commissioned a report, because we, not, we need to understand this artwork, we need to see where, what it's trying to achieve, what its shortcomings are, and who's responsible for providing the interpretation of it. So, um, I know I'm going over time, so I'm sorry. Uh, but I hope that's okay. Um, so we hired a terrific person, Dr. Cheryl, uh, Dr. Cheryl Fogel Hash, and her report said uh, that Park Service needed to produce more braille materials, explain the artwork, which I just mentioned to you, uh, add a mobile guide or wayfinding, um, add tactile models, and address safety concerns. Yeah, that's a bit of a safety concern. So what you can see right here is a woman uh, with a uh, cane uh, who is just steps away from a flooded fountain with leaves in it and the stanchions thrown into the flood, into the into the um, fountain. That's one of Larry Halbert's gorgeous fountains. Okay, and that's what it looked like in March 2021. Thank goodness she had a sighted uh, guy with her that day. He was like, hey, you know, Cheryl, make a turn. <laughs> uh, but um, let's just say that this picture caught the interest of Washington Post. So guess what happened a year later? Dun, dun, dun. It was the 25th anniversary of the FDR Memorial. Some pretty cool people showed up. We have Senator Harkin on the photo on the right. We have Speaker Pelosi on the left. Um, on the left-hand photo, we have Jonathan, Hart, uh, Jonathan Hay Park from MSNBC giving the Pledge of Allegiance as well. Um, Speaker Pelosi as well as students. So this event was coming up, and the uh, photo from Washington Post had run earlier in, in 2001. So guess what the Park Service did, and I'm really glad that they did. They made some accessibility changes. So let's see. It was 1997, the first time that there was something where people said, hey, you know, 
what is this? We can't, we don't understand what this is. And then 2001, and so I have to say, to 2022, when these accessibility features got put in, it was counting the years. Uh, so we did call the sides. They provide braille, they provide tactile, they provide audio. Um, we did another report in 2022. Um, we went back and we said, yep, yeah, those, those are great. Still a few more things that need to be done. Um, more improvements to your website. Still need to, not, not enough good explanation of the artistic braille. Uh, you know, you put in those wayside, those accessibility features, that's great, but you gotta keep them up. What's the plan for that? Uh, let's get tactile models of everything. Um, this big statue's there. So how can we have everybody experience them? Let's have consistent use of braille uh, standards and uh, safety. safety. All right, so this is just a quick uh, just commercial that um, while I'm not worrying about access to the art at the memorial, we're also doing other things, which all, they all kind of lead together, don't they? Um, we, we work on education, we do a teacher's uh, professional development, we're doing one next summer. If there's any, any teachers out there who want to go to DC next year and hang out with me for a week, uh, or if you don't want to hang out with me for a week, then, wish, then, then you know, then they, or tell me, you know, don't, don't take my car then. Um, <laughs> But well, we're going to do a seminar on how to teach the disability history of the Edgewater Memorial. Um, we are doing an educational video about the wheelchair statue campaign. We're going to do replays uh, for FDR and Eleanor's birthday and the ADA anniversary. Okay, so preservation is another piece that we're focused on. Um, preserving history, protecting the memorial and its artwork. Climate change is coming, folks, right? So they say sea level rise impact. We've got to keep the memorial looking top notch. And sometimes all those priorities come together, like today. So today we're here to talk about the Commander in Chief. And I will just be done in one more moment. Commander in Chief, which is now in the house, uh, there is on the left hand side is the bronze piece of Commander in Chief, which is a, an image of FDR in bronze, uh, facing sideways. And on the right hand side is the same image, but in a black and white photo. So he's on a boat uh, wearing a suit, and the wind seems to be blowing his hair. The Commander in Chief by Leonard Bastian is a bronze bar relief, and it was supposed to be placed in the after our memorial. Um, there's some story why at the last minute it didn't get placed, I don't know it, but it is, it is an amazing piece. Um, so instead of it being at the memorial, it's been displayed at the home of Larry Halperin. You remember this name? He's a landscape architect. Uh, Larry Halperin, uh, since the uh, 1990s. And it was donated to the FDR committee by Daria and Rana Halperin. Um, and it is on loan, um, very proud for it to be on loan to the Mark Institute for the next three years. Leonard Bastian, uh, his work is, it is in the FDR Memorial. He created the funeral cortege in the FDR Memorial. Um, he is a person who is very much, uh, who loved FDR uh, and uh, related to the uh, anguish of the times during which FDR uh, led the nation. So, in closing, um, this is a quote from Leonard Bastian that I thought sort of captured, I think, what he was trying to capture in that piece of the Commander in Chief. It reads Our human frame, our gutted mansion, our enveloping sack of beef and ash. It is yet a glory, glorious in defining our universal personality and glorious in defining our utter uniqueness. The human figure is the image of all men and of one man. It contains all and it can, and it can express all. I'm going to ask you. So I want to thank Daria and Rana Halbrand again for making this evening possible to have the commander in chief here at the Harkin Institute. Thank you, Senator Harkin, for taking this piece of art and for 
Um, the whole team being so wonderful in hosting, hosting me, hosting the, the event, um, and I really appreciate the chance to talk with you all this evening. Good evening. My name is Rana Halperin. I am the daughter of Lawrence Halperin, the designer Good of evening. the My Franklin Delano Roosevelt Memorial. I want to thank the people of the Harkin Institute for organizing this wonderful unveiling of the Commander-in-Chief donated by my sister and I to the FDR Memorial Legacy Committee and now on loan to the Harkin Institute. This beautiful art piece was created by the renowned American artist Leonard Bruce Baskin my father's the friend, whom he commissioned to create this art. American we appreciate your profound commitment to the FDR legacy, one of democratic principles so necessary during our current moment in history now more than ever. Thank you for celebrating the arrival of this work and this incredibly important effort and continuation of the Roosevelt legacy. Hello, everyone. I'm Daria Halpern. I wish my sister and I could have joined you in person at this wonderful event, but I'm so happy to have been invited to join you in this way. It's been deeply satisfying to donate the stunning work by my father's friend and colleague in the FDR Memorial Project, the great artist Leonard Baskin. Working on the FDR Memorial with Baskin and the group of remarkable artists and craftspeople was the highlight of my father's career. The commander in chief hung at the entrance to my parents' home for many years. And as we took it down to travel to the Harkin Institute, we took pleasure in knowing that our father would be so pleased to know that is being held on loan in Senator Harkin's building, a place dedicated to advancing democracy and inclusion. Like Senator Harkin, my father was deeply committed to democratic principles in every aspect of his life. Thank you, Senator Harkin and the Harkin Institute for supporting the preservation of the FDR site by holding this peace and for all that you do to inspire and educate future generations in the important fight for democracy. And thank you, Mary Dolan, for your hands-on guidance throughout this process and for your commitment to the FDR Memorial and for becoming a friend. Sorry, um, I am going to do Tom Harkin. He is not going to be here. He's going to do it out in the auditorium. <laughs> so, thank you all for joining in this presentation with all of these speakers. And you can tell what I'm excited to do, which is welcome all of you to the auditorium um, to see the unveiling of the Commander in Chief, where Senator Harkin will be giving his remarks. So, thank you all for joining us. And for those of you online, Thank you again for tuning in. For everyone in person, I invite you to join us in the gallery. 